Good morning again, ladies and gentlemen. Before we get started with our uh, next speaker of the morning, I also want to mention that um, in the Petit Salon, there is a booth set up for the Royal Oak Foundation, which is the American counterpart for the National Trust. And so membership in Royal Oak means that you can be tour any National Trust property, including Chartwell, for free. And so that's a bargain in and of itself. And Royal Oak raises money for the National Trust properties, including Chartwell. So they do a wonderful service, and they're set up out in the lobby, and you can talk to the director himself. All right, to introduce our uh, next speaker, we have someone who is employed by the National Trust. <laughs> Mrs. Catherine Carter. Thank you very much, David, and good morning, ladies and gentlemen. It gives me enormous pleasure to introduce our first speaker this morning, Lord Owen, a major player in politics for a generation, having served in the British Parliament for over five decades originally in the House of Commons and today in the House of Lords. Having held junior ministerial posts in the Department of Health and the Foreign Office, Lord Owen became the youngest Foreign Secretary in over 40 years when Jim Callaghan appointed him to the role in 1977. In the post, he was involved in the development of a number of independent African states and promoted human rights around the globe. He went on to co-found the Social Democratic Party and remains an influential voice on international affairs, most recently making a major contribution to the UK's debate on Brexit. As well as his illustrious political career, Lord Owen is a distinguished writer, authoring more than 20 books on history and politics. These include In Sickness and in Power, illness in heads of government, and his most recent book, British Foreign Policy After Brexit, which examines what lies ahead for the UK in terms of diplomacy, security, and trade as we leave the European Union. Today, he will be talking to us about another of his works, Cabinet's Finest Hour, The Hidden Agenda of May 1940. Using cabinet papers from the UK's National Archive, Lord Owen provides an in-depth look at the pivotal decisions taken by Britain's War Cabinet in the month that Churchill became Prime Minister. Combined with his own experience at the top of government, he gives us a unique perspective in how and why such decisions were made. How the delicate balance between individuals and their loyalties can influence the course of history and the role that collective decision-making plays in a time of crisis, none more so than in May 1940. Without further ado, let me introduce to you all Lord Owen. Well, thank you very much for asking me, and it's a great pleasure to be here. Last night, we saw a remarkable film I've seen many depictions of Churchill on television and in the cinema, and I must say I've never seen it better done. And I've never seen a more lovely picture of Clementine and their relationship. After that, my praise for the film is heavily qualified. Uh, it is when I first began to look at Churchill, and particularly at May 1940, I can't, of course, forget that the Member of Parliament for the constituency in which I was born and which I was Member of Parliament for over 26 years was Nancy Astor. And my uh, mother and my father totally disapproved of her stance on appeasement and couldn't possibly wait to get her out. And then my father was in the British Expeditionary Force and was lifted off Boulogne sailed all through the night in a blacked out ship and awoke in Plymouth Sound and with nothing other than the clothes he walked on, took a taxi and knocked on the door and was opened by my mother and a two-year-old David Owen. So I have some, I suppose, memories 
in the very dim and distant past of a father who, when he came to pick me up from school at the age of seven, I shook him by the hand and said, good afternoon, sir, and I didn't recognize him. He'd been away such a long time in Africa and elsewhere. Now, as far as this book is concerned, it's perhaps important to recognize the photograph on the front. This was a cabinet composed of two major parties. But first, of course, Churchill, on the other side with him, Attlee. And one thing to remember straight away is Attlee had considerable reservations, like a lot of Labour people, about uh, Attlee. But he believed, having been in Gallipoli himself and was the second to last man to leave and had been uh, evacuated off and then came back with having had very bad dysentery, that Churchill was a strategic genius and that he'd been completely right to open the second front. It is an amazing fact of history that these two should be in harness together on this critical issue on which Churchill has been more uh, criticized than almost anything other than coming off the gold standard, that he should be accompanied throughout that whole war by somebody who had the profoundest respect for his strategic vision. And I think that is extremely important. I left the detailed study that I tried to make of this issue of May 1940 with a far deeper respect than I had before for Churchill. Of course, he was a great man, but I had never understood how deeply rooted a Democrat he was. At every stage, he was not a president. He was a prime minister into Paris who brought together in his cabinet a whole range of different opinions and respected them and listened to them and argued democratically with them. And I think that the film did not depict this. It was too easy, if you like, for an American audience used to a president. Too easy, actually, for quite a lot of British people who've been used to uh, semi-presidents in the last uh, 30 years with, who paid very little respect for their cabinet. This book is a peon of praise that intelligent people in the depths of crisis are better spent pooling their knowledge, listening to each other, and then ending up with a decision of collective responsibility and loyally sticking by it. That seems to me the basis of the Socratic dialogue, of the depth of the Greek democracy, and it's something that has been passed down to us. You have a different system. I'm not attacking the presidency, as long as you have the uh, separation of powers, and the power of your constitution. I make no comment on the present situation except to say one thing. I think your constitution is doing very well, thank you. And I'm very pleased. So now I come to the issues that are facing us now with this debate. This is about parliament, this May 1940. Don't ever escape from it. And it started even on the 2nd of September, 3rd of September, the day, that war, day before war was declared. When Ch Chamberlain came to the House of Commons on a Saturday at 8 o'clock, we've never stayed on a Saturday, very, very rarely. The last time was in the start of the Falklands War. And Chamberlain made a most unsatisfactory speech and then rung out from the conservative benches to Arthur Greenwood, who was stepping in as deputy for... Uh, Ackley, speak for England, Arthur. And he did. This man who not many people knew even in the House of Commons very well, rooted in the Labour Party, spoke for England. And what started then eventually allowed Churchill to become Prime Minister because a cross-party alliance started to be formed in the House of Commons. Only a few days later, a leading Liberal, Clement Davis, formed a group of people with one aim in mind, removing Chamberlain and restoring, for the most part, they agreed that it should be Churchill, though there were some who would have looked at Halifax. Very unusual. And the party political battle between left and right 
was even greater than it's been for most of British history. Labour had come from defeat in 1935, having been led by Lansbury, who was a pacifist. It was the strength of Ackley and Greenwood that slowly they moved Labour from being pacifists to accepting the need for rearmament and even being against Munich. But they weren't fit to be government of the country, but they were fit to be the opposition of the country. Then you come to another key decision taken when war was declared. Labour decided that they would not come into the government, even though Chamberlain uh, did speak to Greenwood and to Attlee, but particularly Greenwood about whether or not to come in. Both men were resolved not to. They thought it was better to let the Conservative Party govern with their support and their loyal support. But it was too early probably for Labour and certainly it was too early for the country. Chamberlain was not of a mood to form a genuine coalition. And then you come back to the House of Commons for that two-day extraordinary debate. I'm not going to go into it all when we had these remarkable speeches. You know that Tories lost the vote. If the, sorry, if the Tories had lost the vote, they would have been turfed out of government. But they didn't lose the vote. They had a perfectly respectable majority of 41. Under normal circumstances, they'd have shrugged that off and went away. It was the nature of that debate. And don't forget it. The hero of Zeebrugge, admiral in full uniform, for the first time ever speaking in the House in uniform, not only did he denounce the government for its military handling, and not just of Norway, he opened it up right up, but he actually supported Churchill. Very important speech, as a matter of fact. And then Amory's great speech, you have sat here too long for any good that you are doing. Depart, I say, let us have no more of you in the name of God. And he was down to a whisper, go. You can't imagine the House of Commons. When it's full and it's seething with people and it's late at night, you find that it's a cockpit. The speaker contrived to call Amory in the dinner break. And it was only, he was only able to make that speech when the house filled up, when his friends went out into the smoking room and into the dining room and brought them in. You've got to think about this. This was an extraordinary speech. A conservative, literally only 10 feet away, rounding on his leader. And then next day, when Labour made it a, a, a decided to vote. They, nobody knew. That first day, people were listening to the arguments. That second day, they were focusing more on the vote. And Lloyd George was pushed back. He didn't want to speak. And he was talked very strongly to in Welsh by Clement Davis. And rather lampoon, has Achilles lost his soul? And uh, he did speak. And here was the man who had won the war by common pursuit in the First World War. Very, very effective prime minister in the latter part, last two years. Denouncing Chamberlain's leadership. And not from the Labour benches, but from the Liberal benches. And a, a very effective speech by Morrison, in opening the debate. And then Churchill's support for Chamberlain. Incidentally, two very, very bad interventions by Chamberlain. I won't go on about this. There's a very good book that's just come out. There are books all the time, six minutes. And, uh, it's the time that you took to go through the division lobbies to produce this extraordinary result. It was only Parliament and democracy and the House of Commons that ensured that Ch even Chamberlain knew he had to go. He had a slight hesitation when the war was into Belgium, and he thought perhaps he could hurt, but he never could. Uh, there are a lot of things, on. we won't touch on the history, many of you know about it, how Churchill then got there. How Churchill got there was there was a message from that debate. Now much is said about Churchill, I'll just say one word. I've studied him as a neurologist, as a neuroscientist, and I've looked at the modern diagnosis that he had bipolar disorder. Well, firstly, bipolar disorder was not even invented when uh, Churchill was uh, <laughs> prime minister. The illness they describe is um, a manic depression. Nobody 
has ever been able to find one single episode of mania attached to Churchill. Drunk, occasionally, even in the House of Commons in 1936 when he lost his moorings because he was supporting uh, Edward VIII. No. Yep. And uh, against, uh, he was against his abdication. But this was a man who the House of Commons had watched over many, many years. They knew his moods. The famous neurologist, Lord Brain, called it cyclothymic. And of course he was. He was up and down and everything like that. Why Clementine Churchill was such an important toeholder in his life and could speak critically to him. The film did put that in about how he had become impossible to work with and that this wasn't the man she knew. It was a brave and courageous letter. We all need a Clementine Churchill's in our life. I'm glad to say I have one and she's American and she's married to me. Uh, <laughs> but so we come then to this question. Here he is made prime minister. And he was made prime minister, never forget, by the Conservative Party. The Labour Party made certain that Chamberlain went, but they didn't. And why is he? Catley was quite uh, favorable to uh, Halifax. And as for Halifax, well, I think the best return in usual cases is to go to their mistresses. And his mistress, uh, Baba Metcalf, Lady Metcalf, writes it all down in her diary. He was chronically indecisive on this question for months even before. And he told her quite clearly he was not going to become prime minister. And his excuse then was his excuse later that he couldn't do it from the House of Lords. Technically, he could have done. You couldn't do it now, but he could have done it then. But uh, so then you get Churchill there. And now this is the crucial thing. And this is where I disagree fundamentally with the film. Right from the start, he appointed five people to his war cabinet. Greenwood and Attlee for Labour. He had to appoint Neville Chamberlain. He never doubted it. And he had to appoint Halifax. So he was appointing two people who he'd been at serious disagreement with for quite some time, and himself. The first thing he told us, really, coming through all those debates and these records, remember Finest Hour told us that never had there been any subject of discussion in the cabinet of negotiation or peace. There'd been nine meetings of the cabinet, five of them very crucial period of time. And I think that this is where you come to the real nub of Churchill's leadership. He suddenly presented with Halifax, arguing that you should open discussions with Mussolini. He must have been actually pretty angry, but there is not the slightest sign in anything that is written that he resented the fact that a foreign secretary was raising a completely legitimate issue. I mean, if the foreign secretary can't talk about peace, then who can? I tell you, I believe if Gray had raised the issue of peace in the period consistently up until 1914, I don't believe we would have had a war, it's particularly in 1912, and I've written a book about that period. So here you have Churchill faced right on the moment. Now, I believe that all his instincts were totally and deeply rooted against a negotiation. What I've tried to do in this book is to let you be the judge. You can't put the whole of these nine cabinet meetings in here. I have put the selection of documents which Gilbert thought were the right documents in his, book, his very thick book of documentation. I'm not the right person to make that judgment. I'm not even a historian. And I thought it was better that you should, if we want to follow the argument, my publisher is slightly in the paperback version, I think, putting it back more normally. Maybe it doesn't work in the book. But in fact, on the left-hand side of chapter 14, if you want, you can read through all the descriptions, except one document, which is from the chief of defense staff. All the other documents, which you can read at the same time on the opposite page, are documents that are important for the cabinet discussion. The more I grow older, the more I realize that memory is fallible, very fallible. Whenever I've gone back to my records, I've believed that something quite important was completely different to what I actually said at the time. 
So I recommend the documents, and you can read these documents. But on the 26th of May, a document was put together by the Chiefs of Staff, and I think it is too often forgotten about in this whole thing. Remember, Churchill had had the nerve to move the Chiefs of Staff only two days before. Ironside retired, and Dill came in. Hell of a decision to take in the early weeks. Helped by the fact that Ironside and he had been uh, soldiers together in the Boer War. And, and there must have been some residual respect, because Ironside went without any complaint and offered to be commander of home forces. Tremendous, the national and loyal decision. And Dill comes in. And then Dill, in a typewritten note, which is sent around, and it ends up uh, with some caveats that some parts of the document that they have been reading, uh, the Chiefs of Staff have not had an opportunity to see this report in its final form and reserve to themselves the right to suggest such modifications as they may wish to put forward. A pretty nice little shot across the bows of all the politicians that they're preserving their rights. But in that document, uh, as I say, short uh, and precise, they first of all say that if with our Navy unable to prevent it and our Air Force gone, Germany attempted invasion, our coast and beach defenses could not prevent German tanks and infantry setting. But they said at that stage with air and the airplanes that we had, they did not believe that they would make an invasion and they believed that we would be able to withstand it. And they pointed to the real dilemma that they faced, which they couldn't predict, was they thought in the daytime they could protect the munition factories that were hurriedly making the Spitfires and the Hurricanes, but at night they might not be able to. And if that happened, the balance of air power would tilt against us. And they effectively predicted in this document the Battle of Britain some months hence. Now think if you were at Attlee and Greenwood and hadn't been involved in the war cabinet from September like Churchill and Chamberlain and others, and you're suddenly told there isn't going to be an invasion, and your whole instinct is anyhow to believe that you should fight on. That's a tremendous help to hear the Chief of the Defence Staff phoning you, and I believe it must have buoyed up their commitment. Throughout that whole debate, therefore, Churchill always knew he had the numbers. When it was only five, it was three to two. But he knew that wasn't enough. He had to get Chamberlain away from Halifax. Then he brought in Sinclair, the leader of the Liberal Party, a slight device, legitimate for a prime minister to bring them in, but it wasn't absolutely crucial. But what was crucial was that he was supported now three uh, four to two. But if you read that record of what was said in those meetings, I would be surprised if you don't come to two or three conclusions. One, this is a very adult and democratic debate in which the Foreign Secretary has full range to put his arguments and he puts them at times with passion and with times, as we saw last night, uh, Churchill also replied with passion. But there is also a great deal of rational argumentation of the case and things like it. The fundamental thing that Churchill keeps saying is we are not opening negotiations with Mussolini. We are opening negotiations with Hitler. Now, the importance of that was, without saying it, he was reminding Halifax and, above all, Chamberlain, because Halifax did shift his mind on Hitler before uh, Chamberlain did, that these two got Hitler wrong, and indirectly, I, Churchill, got Hitler right. And what he was really saying to them, once you're into a negotiation with Churchill, what will he do? He'll ask for a ceasefire. We'll have to give it to him. And then, with Germany in France, in the Low Countries, we'll never get him out. And what's more, we'll have a hell of a task 
to get our forces back into battle. Momentum is everything in this sort of situation. We were fighting, and there was a determination. My mother said to me only a few years before her death, you know, David, I never once thought we were going to lose. I thought, like, Mom, come on. You must have. No, she said. And I believe it. And there were millions of others like it. And that, of course, Churchill's rhetoric and his ability to mouth the words that people were often stretched, stumbling for themselves was a fantastic achievement. Now, I, I will go no further except to say one or two things about reading cabinet minutes. I do think, frankly, you, it does help to be a cabinet minister to realize this. Firstly, they very rarely actually record what was said. In the modern days, they're much too short to even attempt it. This was, by Bridges, an extremely good attempt to try to give you a real impression of the arguments. Now, Bridges knew these people. And I think that here it's worth recalling what Roy Jenkins said. For those who in British politics may know, I have a rather tortured career with Roy Jenkins. We were once very great friends when I was a young man, and then we disagreed about Europe. I, incidentally, although you talked about Brexit, I was a Brexiteer. I never thought I would be, but I was. And here's what Jenkins says. Any apparent wavering on Churchill's part throughout the long series of nine meetings are to be explained not by there being little difference between the Churchill and the Halifax positions, as has unconvincingly been argued, but by the harsh reality that Churchill had at the beginning of this three-day marathon, he focuses on 25, 26, 27, was by no means certain of an adequate majority with his own recently chosen cabinet. Notice he says adequate. He had to win around Chamberlain. If he had gone in and refused to talk, then you probably would have ended up with an alliance between uh, Halifax and Chamberlain, because both of them were great believers in talk and negotiation, and so am I, if you can avoid war. But I think that Churchill knew that. So at various times, he did not have a position of totally implacable against negotiations. It was always about when was the right time. He was always against it being now and against it being later. There was no time when a memo was written about negotiations, as we saw last night. He was basically against Halifax to his root, and he didn't really respect him. Let's be honest about it. As soon as he conveniently could, he sent him off to Washington. Halifax hated being sent to Washington, but he had no alternative. He couldn't turn it down. Lothian had died. And then there are a few other personalities which I'd like to draw your attention to. Churchill devoted a huge amount of time in May to getting Lloyd George, the father of the house, the old man, into the war cabinet even, and certainly into the cabinet. He actually offered the war cabinet. And uh, Lloyd George refused. Why? Because Lloyd George thought Winston Churchill would fail, that the Conservatives couldn't turn to another Conservative, and they would turn to him. He's written it down. None of us ever quite give up in politics. There's always a, <laughs> a belief that there'll be a silver lining. You'll come back. I, 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 I'm 79 now. I, I have passed the point that it can happen. But, so there's old Lloyd George being wooed. And you know, it went on actually a whole of the year. When Lothian died, the first person he offered being ambassador to Washington, can you imagine anyone more unsuitable but Lloyd George? who again turned it down because he still thought the church might go. Then I must speak and leave time for questions. One last thing. One of the greatest figures in the Labour Party and Labour movement was Ernest Bevin as Foreign Secretary from 1945 to 51. And I think most people think that. Who was responsible for bringing him into that position? Churchill. He wasn't even a member of Parliament. When Churchill gave Attlee the list of the four key people he wanted immediately to come into the cabinet, not the war cabinet, at the top of the list was Ernie Bevin, the chap who had rounded on Lansbury in 1935 and accused him, to st told him to stop hawking his conscience, his pacifist conscience around the conference table. He was a toughie. 
And Churchill knew it. They'd met together on a fishing issue. He was Transport and General Workers Union, and they were discussing what to do about minesweepers and getting the fishermen online. And he could see the uh, bureaucrats were screwing him up. So he asked for the First Lord of the Admiralty to come, and he came down. This was the first time they met, only some months before the war. And underneath it was a deep-seated respect. And Churchill understood this. It wasn't enough to have just At Attlee and Greenwood, MPs. He needed the organized labor movement. He needed the trade unions. And Ernest Bevin didn't accept until not only did his own union, but the TUC executive had to agree that he should come in and work with the Tories, as they would call with a slight lisp. So he was a remarkable man, Churchill. And in my view, you don't do his legacy full credit if you don't accept what he actually did. All through this period, he respected Parliament. All through this period, he respected the War Cabinet. But he also, at that final moment when he knew he had Chamberlain away from uh, Halifax, and Halifax was on his own, he met with the full Cabinet and got there, as we saw last night, lion-hearted support for war. So I believe this is a man who can genuinely claim to have understood the British parliamentary system, uh, played it like a violin, and sometimes shouted and roared at it, used words in a phenomenal way, but above all was ready to debate an open dialogue, have a conflict of ideas, and reach a decision and stand by it. I think that is his greatest legacy. Questions? Okay, yes. Um. I think he genuinely believed that there was an opportunity uh, for dialogue. And I think that you know, this is a very experienced man. This had been uh, uh, Viceroy of India, and he'd been, uh, been Foreign Secretary. He differed openly in Cabinet with Chamberlain at one stage when he thought that they had collectively got Hitler wrong and that he was not going to ever have a, a peaceful dialogue and that he was lost. So he was not a peaser at this stage. He had moved on from that stage. But I think that... If you lived through that First World War and you saw so many of the flower of England lost, the terrors of the trench warfare and everything like that, he didn't understand warfare as much as Churchill. Churchill understood the impact of the machine gun, which he had seen in South Africa. He, Churchill predicted this Second World War would be every bit as vicious, though in a different way from the trench warfare. But I, do, I respect the fact that the Foreign Secretary was ready to face these people with the issue that there is an alternative, let's look at it and let's have the debate. And in the end of the day, he did accept it, but with bad grace. There was a point, actually, early on the 28th, when he should have packed it in. He could have, should have sensed that Chamberlain had left him and was going to support. You know, just another thing about how Chamberlain looked after Churchill. Uh, Churchill looked after Chamberlain. As soon as he came in, he said, don't leave number 10, we're all right, Clementine and I, we don't need to. You stay there and leave number 10 when you like. And furthermore, I want you to go back to the where you were happy when you were Chancellor of the Exchequer in number 11 down the street. I need you very close. And he told him, and he recorded it back to his sisters, you have my political life in your hands. He knew he did. So last night's film in which Chamberlain was cohorting with Halifax, they were still friends, but there, was, there were tensions. There had been differences of opinion. Over there. Could you comment uh, a little bit on the relationship of Joseph Kennedy and Jefferson? Well, um, how am I to do this? I mean, I'm, 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 I make no secret. I think the greatest politician of the 20th century was not Churchill, but it was Roosevelt. So I, am, I think he was the the most complete politician in peace and war, and a, a, an amazing man. So I'm absolutely devoted to him. 
And I think that, um, I think I've lost your question. That's unfortunately what happens when you're 79. Yes, Joseph Kennedy. Well, I mean, he makes no secret of it. He says, when you've got a shit, you've got a decision. Either you kick him out or you keep him close. And he decided that he had no time for Joe Kennedy at all. And he'd seen that his role, he wanted him out of influence in uh, America, and he wanted him in uh, owing him something. So he makes him to ambassador of the court of St. James, which he wanted to go to, God knows why. But all the flummery and the proper thing, I'd say. He had him off in London. He was ignored by Churchill, and he was treated, uh, he had a bit of a dialogue with uh, Chamberlain, and in fact, uh, who am I to talk about a great historical book? Uh, the Holy Fox is a wonderful book, in my view. But uh, it doesn't seem to be quite so holy as I thought it was, but there we are. But, I mean, I come back to um, attitudes. Uh, Kennedy had no influence on Britain, was disliked intensely, and was seen as an appeaser. But as far as... That's why I think Churchill kept up that former naval person's dialogue. Remember, he did it with Chamberlain's support. Sometimes people have done it as a clandestine thing. No, no, he knew, and Churchill wanted to have his support. He told him, shall I do it? And Chamberlain said, yes, you keep it up. The, the other person he wooed, I was saying about he wooed Chamberlain. He wooed uh, Lloyd George. He wooed Ernest Bevin. The other massive figure was constantly <laughs> uh, messages to... Um, Roosevelt wanting 50 destroyers at one stage. He was stretching the elastic. He knew the Constitution of the United States. But remember that stage, none of us knew, maybe even uh, Roosevelt didn't know whether he was going to stand for his third term. I'm not unsure. Very difficult whole thing. Another wonderful bit of history is actually when they met in Newfoundland. Uh, I strongly recommend that. And that's when uh, Roosevelt screwed Churchill on India. He wrote into the uh, charter words that he was never going to allow the Americans to be supporting the ever-continued empire. And, of course, that was also part of it, was, um, was India. Right? Anyone else? Yes? I had a question. Uh, it has to do with uh, what was in the film that you saw, and, and I think I'd like to see what you... Uh, would like to comment on because essentially they brought up Mussolini in the film and as a as a mediator and I think a lot of American audiences would assume that Mussolini was allied with Hitler at the time and he wasn't he was uh, a, a neutral at that moment and uh, there was some question as to whether or not Mussolini would even join uh, the coalition because he 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 didn't like the uh, the Molotov Ribbentrop Pact and yeah. so apparently uh, he was a perfect uh, a go between, as it were. And I think that wasn't made too clear in the film. Maybe you can comment on that. Yes, well, the, a diplomat called Wells had persuaded Roosevelt that he should go out in February uh, to see Mussolini, uh, Hitler, uh, Renault, and Churchill, which he did. And in February and March, it became pretty obvious to anybody who was following carefully that Mussolini had no time for the Wells Initiative, and Wells made it quite clear to uh, Roosevelt that there was no negotiating opportunity at the time. Now, one of the problems was is that Britain was very nervous about him being sent because they didn't want, at that time, Chamberlain, the last thing he uh, wanted was a dialogue with Mussolini. And I think that... Roosevelt himself didn't want to be get too prominently in as an arbiter, lest he be sucked in and then couldn't deliver in American public opinion. So it was all a bit premature. But most people in the know knew. The, the people who were keen were the diplomats in Rome, and particularly uh, Mussolini's son-in-law, who was the foreign minister. And he was probably pretty keen. But, you know, Churchill... Uh, Hitler met with Mussolini on the Bremen Pass in March, and it was absolutely clear by then, in March, that there was no dice for this whole thing. This was always one of the extraordinary things that such a skillful diplomat as Halifax kept pushing when it was becoming clearer and clearer that the American initiative had shown that the 
initiative with Mussolini was not dead. Also, the terms that Mussolini wanted were quite big. I mean, they are discussed. I mean, I personally have no problems of giving land away in Africa. I believe we could have given Ray land in Africa in 1912 and avoided a war. And I didn't think that, that would be a problem. And even in the Mediterranean, some of the areas, Britain had unreasonably held a position of dominance in the Mediterranean. Why? Because Suez Canal was vital to us and India was the connection. So so much of our foreign policy was influenced by India. And uh, I, my overall feeling, I think, is that it wasn't just Mussolini that he was after. I think that uh, Halifax was too clever. He knew it was basically Hitler, and he knew when Churchill said that in the cabinet, small group of war cabinet, that that was right. But he didn't want to lead with that because it was more respectable to say we're having a dialogue with Mussolini and more respectable for him to say it. I don't know his motivation. I, as I say, there's nothing wrong with the foreign secretary being on the side of peace. And there's nothing wrong with him trying to get this discussed. He went on at it too long. And he made a half-hearted gesture of saying that he couldn't stay, implied he'd resign, but he knew he couldn't resign. You couldn't resign in that situation. So it was always, in my view, a battle for minds. Halifax held very strongly to this view, over and above what it would normally be. But of course, I'd explain that easily, that he's in the House of Lords where deals are not done and it's a dreadful place. And uh, Chamberlain, for all his uh, weaknesses, had been at various stages a fantastic leader in the Tory party and of managing the House of Commons. And Chamberlain, therefore, was always sensitive to the mood and shift in his own party that had got him out. There were still a lot of people who were loyal to him, but he didn't have enough, and he knew it. He decided to accommodate to Churchill and was flattered by his uh, flattery and his warmth. He defended him against when the, um, the, the diatribe about the guilty men was written. And Chamberlain was very upset about it. He kept on asking Labour members in the war cabinet and elsewhere to defend him. Again, Churchill went out of his way. And when the Labour Party said he couldn't be um, the deputy, Churchill took it on the chin. He never told that he wasn't going to be the deputy. He went to France, and as he left the cabinet room and his hand was on the door, he turned round and he said, mind the shop, will you, Neville? And of course, he then took the chair, and he was effectively his deputy. Very skillful handling of the Labour Party, very skillful handling of people. I, I must leave on that note. I think he was man, his human relations, his man-to-man uh, -man relations, and then when he dealt with his wife, rather lovely thing in the film, he, he was a very empathetic person, uh, Churchill. Don't ever be deluded by the shouting and the resolution. Something. And it was good, for we saw that human side of him in the film. He was a very remarkable man, and he didn't have bipolar disorder. And doctors shouldn't always feel you have to put labels on everybody. Every now and then there are exceptional people, and you don't have to label them to find it out. Thank you, Lord Owen. Ladies and gentlemen, I think you all now know why we chose Lord Owen to be the opening speaker at uh, this year's conference. We are now going to take a break until 10.30. Thank you very much.